بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين تفرد بالربوبية وأبان للإنسانية دلائل الألوهية أحمده تعالى وأشكره على ما أسدى من منة وعطية ودفع من نقمة وبلية وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له أنقذنا بالبعثة المحمدية من براثن الإشراك والوثنية وأعزنا بالتوحيد وأبطل مسالك الجاهلية وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمدًا عبد الله ورسوله خير البرية وسيد البشرية صلى الله عليه وعلى آل بيته الأطهار وصحابته الأبرار وتابعيه الأخيار صلوات تامات كاملات متعاقبات ما تعاقب الليل والنهار وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for allowing us to witness the beginning of the month of Al-Muharram if you're following the international sighting the moon was sighted and tonight at Maghrib the month of Al-Muharram started and Al-Muharram is one of the months that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a special significance and importance to by making it one of the four sacred months as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ Surely the number of months with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 12. And this was ordained the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. And from these 12 months, four of them are sacred. And those four sacred months... The Prophet ﷺ explained that three of them come consecutively and one of them is separate. The separate one is the month of Rajab. And the three consecutive sacred months are the months of Dhul Qa'da, Dhul Hijjah, and Al Muharram. So these months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given special significance to, so we have to respect these months as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He favored some times over other times. He favored some months over other months. He favored some days over other days. So as Muslims, as people who submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we give reverence to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given honor to. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored something, then we honor what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored. So Allah has honored these months by making them sacred. So Al-Muharram is one of those sacred months. Now in the month of Muharram, there is one day that is more significant than the other days. Even though the whole month is sacred, one of the days of that month, the, the month of Al-Muharram, is more significant than the rest of the days of that month. And that is the 10th of Muharram, that is the day of Ashura. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to fast on the day of Ashura and he recommended his companions to do the same. And the significance of the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, why is it special? What happened on that day to give it religious significance? The day of Ashura is a day that has significance from a religious perspective and it also has significance from a historical perspective. But the problem is when people get confused and they mix up the religious aspect of Ashura with the historical aspect of Ashura. Remember, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended with the passing away of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left this world, revelation stopped so everything that was part of the religion when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away remains part of the religion today 
And anything that was not part of the religion when the Prophet ﷺ passed away is not part of the religion today and will never be part of the religion. This is a fact that we all have to understand. So Ashura has religious significance, but that religious significance can only be taken from the Prophet ﷺ. And whatever happened on the day of Ashura after the passing away of the Prophet ﷺ, it is of historical significance. But we cannot bring new practices into the religion based on historical events. So this is a very important point to remember when we are talking about the day of Ashura. Do not confuse the religious aspect of it with the historical aspect of it. Now regarding the religious aspect of the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, why is it considered a day that has special significance in Islam from a religious point of view? And the answer to that can be found in many narrations from the Prophet ﷺ. One of those famous narrations you can find in Sahih al-Bukhari where it is mentioned, قَدِمَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْمَدِينَةِ فَرَآ الْيَهُودَ تَصُومْ يَوْمَ عَاشُورَ That the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, he found the Jews of Medina fasting on the day of Ashura. And remember, the city of Medina, it had three Jewish tribes living there when the Prophet ﷺ came to the city. The tribe of Banu Qaynuqa', the tribe of Banu Nadir, and the tribe of Bani Quraidha. So these three Jewish tribes, they lived in Medina when the Prophet ﷺ came there. So the Prophet ﷺ saw the Jews fasting on the day of Ashura, and he asked them about it. He said, ma hadha? That why are you fasting? And the Jews replied to the Prophet ﷺ, they said to him, هذا يوم صالح, هذا يوم they said to him, this is a righteous day. This is a good day. This is the day that Allah saved Bani Israel from their enemy. The enemy of Bani Israel, of course, that is Fir'aun. So the day of Ashura, this is the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam and his people Bani Israel from the Fir'aun from the Fir'aun who they had been living under his oppression for so many years. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the Fir'aun by drowning him and his army in the sea. And when did that happen? That happened on the day of Ashura. That happened on the 10th of Muharram. A great event in the history of mankind. And it is an event of religious significance, of course. So, Musa alayhi salam, as a sign of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he fasted on that day. So this is why the Jews were fasting on that day. Because Musa alayhi salam fasted on that day as a sign of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for destroying the Fir'aun. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard this, he said to his companions, or he said to these Jews, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِمُوسَى مِنْكُمْ That we have more right to Musa than you. We have more right to Musa than you. Because if you think about it, the Jews... At that time, they were not actually following Musa alayhi salam. If they were truly followers of Musa alayhi salam, they would have accepted the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is prophesized in their book, in the Torah. الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي التَّورَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he is mentioned in the Torah and the Injil. So, if those Jews of Medina were truly followers of Musa alayhi salam, then they would have accepted the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And a few of them did. So those were the true followers of Musa alayhi salam and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the majority of them rejected the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So by rejecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they're actually rejecting Musa alayhi salam as well. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to these people, نَحْنُ أَحَقُّ بِمُوسَى مِنْكُمْ That we have more right to Musa than you. Because we are actually the ones who are on the way of Musa alayhi salam. And you are not. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted on that day and he recommended his companions to fast on that day as well. And that is what gives the day of Ashura a religious significance. If somebody asks you, why do you fast on the 10th of Muharram? Why do you fast on the day of Ashura? This is the answer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel from the Fir'aun on that day. So Musa alayhi salam fasted 
And our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also fasted as a sign of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we follow their example. This is the religious aspect of the day of Ashura. And this is the religious significance of the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura. Whatever happened after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that has historical value and historical significance, but it cannot change anything with regards to the rulings of the religion. This is something that's vital to understand. Now, why do we fast on the day of Ashura? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Siyamu yawmi Ashura ahtasibu ala Allah an yukaffir as-sanata allati qablahu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that fasting on the day of Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, I have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this will serve as an expiation for the sins of the previous year. So it's a great opportunity to do a little effort and get a great reward. You fast one day and you have one, year's, one year worth of sins wiped out. This is from the, from the graciousness and the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala towards his servants. That you just have to make a, a small effort, an easy effort, fasting for one day. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in, in reward for that, he gives you a great reward of having your sins wiped out for one whole year. So that's basically the religious aspect of the day of Ashura. Why is it a special day? Because it is the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Bani Israel from the Fir'aun. Why do we fast on that day? Because Musa alayhi salam fasted on that day. And following that example, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fasted that day to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reward for doing that is having one year worth of sins wiped out. So that's basically the religious point of view regarding the day of Ashura in a nutshell. Right? All right. Now if we go about 50 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then there is an event that happened on the 10th of Muharram in the year 51 of the Hijrah. And that is a tragic event in the history of mankind. And that is the martyrdom of the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu wa ardah. On the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, in the 51st year of the Hijrah, that was the day that al Hussein radiyallahu an was murdered and he became a shaheed in the land of Karbala. When did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa pass away? He passed away in the 11th year of Hijrah, in the year 11 Hijrah. And when did Hussein radiyallahu an become a shaheed? In the year 51. So there's a 40-year difference from the time that the Prophet ﷺ passed away to the time that al Hussein radiallahu an was martyred. So what happened in Karbala is tragic and it brings sadness to any Muslim, but it does not introduce any new practices into Islam. How can any new practices be introduced into Islam based on something that happened 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ left this world. From the last verses towards the end of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, just a few months before he passed away, one of the famous verses that was revealed to him, just about three months before he passed away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse, اليَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ On this day, I have perfected your religion for you and I have completed my favor unto you and I am pleased to give you Islam as your religion. That was about three months before the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Allah is telling us that on this day your religion has been perfected. When something is perfect, then you don't add to it and you don't subtract from it because that will take away the perfection. If something is perfect, you don't change it at all. So on that day, the religion was perfected. So there is, there is no possibility of any change. And the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us was completed. All of the rules that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordained upon us, they were completed on that day. So there are no new acts of worship that are going to come after that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us Islam as our religion. It's perfect and it is complete. So something that happened 40 years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, 
We cannot bring anything new into the religion based upon that. But if we look at what happened at Karbala with Al Hussein radiallahu an from a historical perspective, then yes, there are many lessons that we can learn from what happened. Now the fact that Al Hussein radiallahu an he was martyred on a day that is special. He was martyred on the day of Ashura. That points to the virtue of Al Hussein. The fact that he died on a day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made a special day. It was already a special day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Al Hussein martyrdom on that day. So Ashura is not special because Hussein died on that day, but it is a virtue of Hussein that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him shahada on that day. For example, it's similar to someone who dies in the month of Ramadan, for example. When someone dies in the month of Ramadan, we, we have high hopes for that person. That Alhamdulillah, it was the month of Ramadan, a great month, and this person passed away in Ramadan. Inshallah, that's a good sign for him. That's a good sign for him. Do we say that Ramadan is special because so-and-so died in Ramadan? Or do we say so-and-so is special because Allah chose the month of Ramadan for him to die. It points to the virtue of the person. So Ashura is not special because Al Hussein died on Ashura. Ashura was already special before that for the reasons that we just talked about. But the fact that he died on Ashura, it points to a virtue in Al Hussein. Same thing applies, like we said, for someone who dies in Ramadan, someone who dies on the day of Jumu'ah. If someone dies on the day of Jumu'ah, we have high hopes for that person. We say, inshallah, this is a good sign. You're not going to say that, okay, Jumu'ah is special because so-and-so died on Jumu'ah. No, but you're going to say that, inshallah, there was something good in this person, so Allah chose that this person would die on Jumu'ah. Same thing applies for a person who dies during Hajj. You don't say Hajj is special because so-and-so died during Hajj. No, you say that that person, inshallah, is special because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for him to die during Hajj. So this is the lens that we need to look at this from. Ashura is not special because Al Hussein died on that day. Ashura was already special way before that. Even before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ashura was already special. But the fact that Al Hussein died on that day, it points to the fact that he was a person of virtue, and Allah subhanahu wa taala chose an honorable day for him to become a shaheed. Radiyallahu anhu wa arda. All right. Sadly, due to the events of Karbala on the day of Ashura in the 51st year of Hijrah. Sadly, due to that, many innovations were born that people brought into the religion of Islam. Many un-Islamic practices. And a majority of those practices are still practiced to this day. And these actions that people have innovated into the religion, they have absolutely no basis in Islam. You can find no evidence for doing these things in the Quran, nor can you find any evidence for doing these things in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ or the actions of his companions. So the people who do these innovations, they think they are doing something good, when in reality they are doing something that is that is wicked, that is very bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qul hal nunabbiukum bil a'mala. الذين ضل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون صنعا. Allah سبحانه وتعالى is telling us, shall we not tell you who are the biggest losers? Who are the biggest losers in terms of their deeds? Who are they? Who are the biggest losers in terms of their deeds? الذين ضل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا. Those people whose efforts in this dunya go to waste. وَهُمْ يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعَ And while they were doing these efforts, they thought that they were doing good. They thought that they were doing actions that will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When in reality, all of those actions, it goes to waste. Imagine that, making such an effort and your actions are worthless. You think that you're doing good, but in reality, you are doing evil. These people are deceived. And that is the nature of any innovation in the religion. Any act that a person makes part of the religion that the Prophet ﷺ did not come with, then this person, even if he thinks he's doing good, he's actually doing evil. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ 
في أمرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد whoever innovates into this matter of ours into this religion of Islam something that is not part of it some, you bring something new and make it part of the religion then this will be rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so sadly due to the events of Karbala many people they brought into the religion a lot of innovative practices that have no basis in Islam they think that they are doing good when in, re in reality they are doing evil and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all. Imagine beating yourself with chains until your skin is ripped. Is this something that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ever sanctioned? Is this something that you find in the Quran or the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Absolutely not. People ripping their clothes, crying loudly and wailing, beating themselves, cutting themselves, even little children, right? Sometimes... The parents are taking newborn children and cutting them too to show their sadness over what happened to Al Hussein in Karbala. Do any of these actions have any basis in Islam? Is this the way that the Prophet ﷺ mourned the companions that he lost in various battles? During the Battle of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ lost 70 of his beloved companions. And included amongst them was his beloved uncle Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib in Uhud. Do you think this made the Prophet ﷺ sad? Absolutely, he was very sad. But did he show his sadness by doing these things? No, not at all. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ has always been our guide and our example. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ Surely in the Messenger of Allah you have a good example. So we have to always look back how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with situations and we have to make sure that we keep him as our example. So all of this mourning in the name of Al-Hussein that people do when they say that we are showing our sadness at the death of Al-Hussein by doing these things, they have no basis in Al-Islam. And imagine, imagine what kind of anti-da'wah this becomes when non-Muslims see it. Right? We as Muslims were commanded to show the beauty of Islam with our actions. And that is the most powerful form of da'wah. Live as a good Muslim according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, and without even saying a word, you will be an example of da'wah. People will become interested in Islam by seeing the actions of the Muslims if they're truly practicing in the right way. But when people do things like this, imagine people beating themselves with chains until their skin is ripped and doing it even to little children, and a non-Muslim seeing this stuff on, on TV, and thinking that, okay, if this is Islam, if this is what Islam commands its followers to do, then we don't want to have anything to do with this religion, right? So it becomes a form of anti-da'wah. It's something that can turn people away from Islam. If non-Muslims have the wrong impression that this is what Islam teaches, then why would they want to have anything to do with Islam? So this is something that's very important for us to understand. And of course, Al Hussein, radiallahu an, he is free from any of these type of actions. He never sanctioned any of these types of actions. So he is free of this, and he has no blame regarding this. And we, as Muslims, as followers of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have the utmost love and the utmost honor and the utmost respect for the Ahlul Bayt, for the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way that we show our love for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family is that whenever we mention them, we make dua for them. Whenever you mention the name of Al Hassan or Al Hussein or Ali or Fatima or Aisha or any of the Ahlul Bayt, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we always make dua for them. We say Radiallahu an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them, right? So we show our respect and our honor for the Ahlul Bayt. And anyone who does not love the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then this person has a deficiency in their Iman for sure. We as Muslims, we are commanded to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and from our love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is to have love for those whom he loved. Right? You cannot truly love a person 
unless you love whatever that person loves or whoever that person loves. As Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said a beautiful statement. Remember this statement. Inna mahabbata mahboob al mahboob min tamami mahabbat al mahboob. Right, for those of you who understand Arabic, this is a very deep statement. Inna mahabbata mahboob al mahboob min tamami mahabbat al mahboob. Shaykh al Islam ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said that surely loving the beloved of your beloved is from the perfection and the completeness of your love of the beloved. What does that mean? It means that if you truly love someone, then you have to love whoever that person loves. And if you don't, that means your love for that person is incomplete. So we all, as Muslims, we love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is part of our iman. For your love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be complete, you must love whoever he loved. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved someone, and you don't love that person that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved, that means your love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not complete. Because from the completeness of love for the beloved is to love the beloved of the beloved. So this is a very deep statement from Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah that is absolutely true. So our love for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is complete. So we love whatever he loved, we love whoever he loved. And the Prophet sallallahu loved his family. He loved his family. And he had a very special love for these two grandsons of his from his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha. He really loved Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein. Even though they were both very young when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, he loved these two kids. And there are so many narrations, so many hadith which show the affection that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had for these boys. Once even when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was giving a khutbah, he was giving a khutbah for Jumu'ah. And Al-Hassan and al Hussein, his grandsons, they're very little at that time, they come out in the masjid. And they're wearing long, a long article of clothing so that they're actually tripping on their clothing. Just learned how to walk, right? So they're walking in the masjid while their grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is giving a khutbah. They walk into the masjid with a wobbly walk of a small kid who's just learning how to walk. And they keep tripping on their clothes. So the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he actually left the mimbar he got off the member, he took the kids, brought them back up, and continued with the khutbah. Can you imagine the love that the Prophet ﷺ had for these boys? Right? So, if a person doesn't have love for Al Hassan or Al Hussein, then we cannot say that that person has a complete love for the Prophet. ﷺ. So, yes, as the Ahlul Sunnah, as the people who follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, ﷺ, we have love for his family, we have love for Al-Hassan, and we have love for al Hussein, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So for awareness purposes, it's very important to know what happened to al Hussein, What led to the events at Karbala? What led to the martyrdom of al Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu anhu, 40 years after his grandfather, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, passed away? Who is responsible for this crime? Who is responsible for the murder of Al Hussein radiallahu an? So we, we really need to be aware of all of these things. Right? If we if we want to show the beauty of our religion in the correct light, we have to know how to answer these questions. Because especially during the month of Muharram, these questions are going to come up. People will watch on the news, they'll see on CNN people beating themselves with chains, and they're gonna ask you about it. Why do people do that? What is the history behind this? Is this part of Islam or not? People are going to ask these type of questions, right? So we need, to, we need to be firmly grounded in knowledge of what really happened. And we need to know the right way of reacting to this and the wrong way of reacting to this. So we can clarify this correctly to the people. As it has been said, knowledge is the cure for ignorance. If you don't know something, right, then you're not going to be able to explain it in the right way. And what is the cure to that inability? The cure to that is seeking knowledge and gaining knowledge so that you will have knowledge equipped in yourself and you will be able to spread that knowledge to others as well. Okay, so a little back background. Al-Husayn, he was the son of Ali. 
He was the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib ibn Abdul Muttalib. And the mother of Al Hussein was Fatima bint Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his father was Ali and his mother was Fatima radiallahu anhum ajma'in. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned about Al Hussein that he is one of the leaders of the youth of Jannah. Al Hussein and his brother Al Hassan, they are the leaders of the youth of Jannah. Al Hussein spent his early childhood with his grandfather. He loved his grandfather and he spent a lot of time with his grandfather, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was six years old when his grandfather sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. So six years to absorb knowledge from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Six years to absorb manners from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Six years to absorb character from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So even though he was very young, he benefited a lot from the, the time he spent with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa. And Abu Bakr continued to honor Al-Hasan and al Hussein, Knowing that they are from Ahlul Bayt, they are from the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr continued to honor them. After Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, Umar radiallahu anhu continued to honor them. After Umar passed away, Uthman radiallahu anhu continued to honor them. Right? So the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they understood the position of these young men. That these were people who were important to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so they are important to us. Umar radiallahu anhu actually favored Al-Hasan and Al-Hussein over his own son. Such to the extent that one day, the son of Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he complained to his father. He said, Ya Abati, oh my father, I'm your own son, but I see that you favor al Hussein over me. Like you love him more than you love me. And I'm your own son. And Umar radiallahu anhu, he said to his son, Ya Bunayya, oh my son, show me someone who has parents that are better than his parents. Who is his father? His father is Ali ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who is his mother? His mother is Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So look at his parents. How can I not honor him? Of course I have to honor him. Right? So this was the attitude that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had towards both Al-Hasan and al Hussein. Now, after the passing away of the fourth Khalifa, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Khilafah, it went to Al-Hasan ibn Ali. The Khilafah actually went to Al-Hasan ibn Ali. Right? But there was a lot of political turmoil that was going on during that time. And there was a lot of instability that was going on during that time. So Al-Hasan, in order to preserve the peace for the Ummah, he stepped down from his position as Khalifa after only about six months. Al-Hasan was the Khalifa. He is from Khulafa al-Rashidin. Right? Many people, when you think of Al-Khulafa al-Rashidun, you think of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. But actually, Al-Hasan is from them as well. But because the time span that he was, Amir al-Mu'mineen was so short, many times he is not mentioned as being part of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. But in actuality, he is. So he was the fifth Khalifa. He stayed for about six months, and then in order to preserve the stability and peace for the people, he decided to step down, and he gave the rule to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. An. Now the Prophet said, Al-Khilafatu fi ummati thalathuna sana, thumma mulkun ba'da thalik. The Prophet said that Al-Khilafah, the system of the Khalifa, it will last for this Ummah after the death of the Prophet وسلم, for 30 years. The Prophet وسلم, said this while he was alive, that the Khilafah, it will last for 30 years. And then it will become a kingdom after that. So if you look at the time that Abu Bakr was Khalifa, about two years, and then Umar, about 10 years. Then Uthman, about 13 years. Then Ali, about 
five years, right? If you add them all together, it becomes about 29 and a half years, 29 years and six months. Then Al-Hassan ibn Ali became the Khalifa, and he stayed in that position for six months. So that completes 30 years. It fulfills this prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the Khilafah, the 30 years of Khilafah, it was Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and a short period of six months for Al-Hassan ibn Ali. ثُمَّ مُلْكٌ بَعْدَ ذلك. And then after that, it became a kingdom. So Muawiyah is actually considered the first king in Islam. Right? And then, as you know, he passed it on to his son, Yazid. Right? And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute, inshallah. So Al-Hassan, in order to preserve peace and stability and in order to avoid bloodshed, he stepped down from his position and he gave it to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. All right, now during the rule of Muawiyah, before Muawiyah passed away, he appointed his son Yazid to be his successor. Even though there were people who were more deserving for that position, they were more qualified, they were more religious, they were more knowledgeable than Yazid, Muawiyah decided to appoint Yazid as his successor. And this was a mistake. This was a mistake. But it does not take the status of Muawiyah as a companion of the Prophet ﷺ away. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they have a special honor that must be preserved. But that doesn't mean that they can't make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they are infallible. They can make mistakes. They are human beings. They are not prophets. They are not ma'asum. Right? So they can make mistakes. So the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah, they agree that Muawiyah appointing Yazid as his successor, Muawiyah appointing his son Yazid as his successor, it was a mistake. But that doesn't mean anyone has the right to insult Muawiyah or to take away from the status of Muawiyah as a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. No, his honor must be preserved. But as a human being, we can say that this was an error in judgment. And the ulama have mentioned that Perhaps the reason that Muawiyah appointed his son, even though there were people who were more deserving than him, perhaps one of the reasons for this was he thought that this was the best thing to preserve the political stability. It was a mistake. It was an ijtihad that he made. And everyone can agree that it was incorrect. But again, we cannot take away from his status and we cannot disparage him or insult him because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said La tasubbu ashabi Do not insult my companions and Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So when we mention his name you still say Muawiyah radiallahu anhu As for his son Yazid that's a different story Yazid was not a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was not from the Sahaba so his honor and his status does not need to be protected like the honor of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. So there's a difference here we need to understand. All right, when Muawiyah radiallahu anhu passed away, Yazid became the ruler. And many of the Sahaba who were still alive at that time, they felt that this was a mistake. But many of them still gave their oath of allegiance to Yazid just in order to keep peace, right? They said, okay, we don't agree with this, but... You know, if we, if we revolt, then perhaps there will be a war and there will be a lot of bloodshed and a lot of Muslims will die. So a number of Sahaba, they gave their allegiance to Yazid just to avoid fitna, just to avoid turmoil, right? But there were some companions of the Prophet wasallam who decided not to give their bay'ah to Yazid. They decided not to give any oath of allegiance to Yazid. And from those companions who refused to give allegiance to Yazid from amongst them was Abdullah ibn al-Zubair radiallahu an, a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and also Al-Husayn ibn Ali. Al-Husayn, he did not give his bay'ah, he did not give an oath of allegiance to Yazid. Now, the seat of rule during that time was in Damascus. So, the capital, basically, of the Islamic world was Damascus. During the time of the Prophet wasallam, it was al Madina, That's the first capital of the Islamic world. And then it remained in Medina during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr 
and Umar and Uthman. And then Ali radiallahu anhu moved it to Kufa, which is in Iraq. And then Muawiyah radiallahu anhu moved it to Damascus in Asham, right? And they did this for political reasons. Okay, so during the time of Muawiyah, the seat of power was in Damascus. And it remained as the capital of the Islamic world during the time of Yazid as well. So the capital during the reign of Yazid was in Damascus. All right. Now, the people of Kufa were not happy with Yazid being appointed as the ruler of the Islamic world. Now, Yazid is in Damascus, but the people of Kufa in Iraq, they're not happy that Yazid has been appointed as the ruler. And they know, the people of Kufa know that al Hussein did not give his bay'ah to Yazid. So they formulate a plan. The people of Kufa formulate a plan. They say to themselves, like, look, we don't want Yazid to be our ruler. And al Hussein, he didn't give him his oath of allegiance, so al Hussein doesn't want him to be the ruler either. So if we can get Hussein to come to us and become our leader, then we can go and take power from Yazid. This was the plan of the people of Kufa. So they started writing letters to Al Hussein. Now Al Hussein was in Medina. And these people in Kufa, they're in Iraq. So they start writing letters to Al Hussein to be delivered to Medina, telling him to come. Come, we will make you our leader. And we have enough manpower, we have enough people that we can form an army and we can go to Damascus and we can take power away from Yazid and you can become the Khalifa. Now, how many letters did al Hussein receive from the people of Kufa for this? He received 500 letters total. Now, just imagine this, 500 letters in that time. It's not like you can make a group chat on WhatsApp and send it to five, send 500 letters like that, no. During that time, to send a letter, to send one letter was a difficult process. You write the letter, you have to give it to a messenger, a messenger has to go and hand deliver it to the receiver. And the distance from Kufa to al Madina, it's not a small distance, it's a distance of some days travel. So even to send one letter, it's a huge effort that has to be undertaken. So imagine 500 letters al Hussein received over a period of time from the people of Kufa to him, asking him to come and become their leader so that they can revolt against Yazid. So al Hussein realized that this is, this is huge. I, I received 500 letters. So that means these people, they are united and... They're not playing around. This is not a joke. This is something that is very real. So after realizing the importance of this, this issue, al Hussein radiallahu an, he decided to send his cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil was a cousin of al Hussein, And al Hussein sent him from Medina to go to Kufa. Go to Kufa personally. Analyze the situation. These people sent me these letters. I want you to go there and and meet them in person and see if they're really, really serious about this. Are they really ready to support me if I come so that we can go and take power from Yazid? I want you to go and analyze it personally. So Muslim ibn Aqil, the cousin of al Hussein, he goes to Kufa to meet with these people to see if it's really doable, if this is really feasible what these people are proposing. So Muslim, he goes to Kufa and he has a friend of his who lives there in Kufa his name is Hani ibn Urwa. Hani ibn Urwa, a close friend of Muslim ibn Aqil. So Muslim tells Hani, this is the situation. al Hussein is in Medina. He received all of these letters from the people of Kufa. So what do you think? So Hani, he says, okay, let's bring the people. Let's gather them and we'll talk to them and see what the situation is. So that's what they did. Hani and Muslim, they gather the people of Kufa to talk to them to see if they're really serious about this and they're really ready to go through with this. That it's not just talk, that they're really ready to put their lives on the line for this effort. So Muslim ibn Aqil, he talks to the people of Kufa. And in the beginning, 1,000 of the men of Kufa, they gave their word to Muslim ibn Aqil that yes, let al Hussein come here. We will be loyal with him to the end. 
In the beginning, it was 1,000 people who gave their promise. Then that number grew to 5,000 people, 12,000 people. In the end, 18,000 people, 18,000 men gave their word to Muslim Ibn Aqil that yes, just tell al Hussein to come and we promise we will be loyal to him. We are enough people to form our own state, 18,000 people. We can form our own state. We can form our own army and we can follow through with what we are proposing. So they gave their word to Muslim ibn Aqil, 18,000 people. That's not a small number. That is enough to form a state and to form an army and to stage a revolution. It's enough. It was enough in that time. So due to this promise that Muslim ibn Aqil got from the people of Kufa, from such a huge number of people, from 18,000 people, due to this promise, he wrote a letter to be delivered to al Hussein in al Madinah, And in this letter he said, I have 18,000 people who have pledged their allegiance to you, who have promised that they will stand by you, 18,000 people. So come, come to Kufa, come to Kufa. This was the letter that Muslim wrote to al Hussein. So Muslim gives the letter to the messenger to go and deliver it to Medina. Now remember, it's a few days journey from Kufa to Medina. The messenger takes the letter and he goes on his way. Now, during this time, after Muslim sent the messenger with the letter to Medina, but before the, the letter reached Medina, during that time span, Yazid came to know, Yazid in Damascus, Yazid came to know what was going on. You know, if 18,000 people know about something, it's, it's very difficult for there to be no leaks. There's going to be some leak, right? So Yazid found out what was going on. Yazid found out that, you know, the people of Kufa, they're planning some type of uprising, so Yazid, in order to squash this, he didn't want anyone to revolt against him, he sent a letter to his governor in Iraq. So Yazid is based in Damascus, but he has his governors in the different parts of the Islamic world. His governor in Iraq was a man named Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Now Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he was a, an evil person, a ruthless person, a person who had no mercy towards others, right? So Yazid, he sent a message to this governor of Iraq, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, go to Kufa and find out what's going on. If you find that these people are planning an uprising or a revolt, then make sure that you squash it, kill it. So Ubaidullah, the governor of Iraq, he goes to Kufa and he investigated. He investigated and he found out that the people had gathered at the place of Hani ibn Urwa. And Muslim ibn Aqil was in town. This was the information he got when he reached Kufa and he investigated. That Muslim ibn Aqil is in town and Hani ibn Urwa is also involved in this. So he goes to the home of Hani ibn Urwa and he asks him, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad asks Hani, where is Muslim ibn Aqil? I know Muslim is here in Kufa. I know he's here. Tell me where he is. And Hani says, Wallahi, I will never tell you. I will never tell you. And this, then Ubaidullah and his men start torturing Hani in order to get this information out of him. But Hani, alhamdulillah, he does not break under the pressure. Even though he's tortured, he does not give them the information that they want. And he actually says to them, in order to taunt them, he said, Wallahi, you can torture me all you want. Even if Muslim ibn Aqil was hiding under my shoe, I would not lift up my foot to show you. You can torture me all you want. It's not going to work. So they tortured him, and when they realized they're not going to get any information from him, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad killed Hani ibn Urwa. He killed him. And this happened on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. This happened on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, the day of Tarwiyah, the day that Hajj starts, actually. right? So Hani ibn Urwa was killed by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad on this day. All right. Now remember, Muslim ibn Aqil, he sent a letter to al Hussein that yes, you, we have 18,000 people who are promising their loyalty to you, so come to Kufa. So eventually, the letter reaches al Hussein. He gets the letter. He reads the letter and he's very happy. Like, alhamdulillah, 18,000 people promising their support. And Muslim is advising me to come to Kufa. So he's happy with this letter. And he doesn't know what has happened in the meantime since the sending of the letter to 
the delivery of the letter. During that time span, he doesn't know what has happened, that Yazid has found out, he has sent his governor, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, to Kufa. They have killed Hani ibn Urwa. They're looking for Muslim ibn Aqil. Hussein doesn't know any of this, right? So he prepares himself and some members of his family that let's go to Kufa. Let us go to Kufa. As he is preparing himself to go to Kufa from Medina, many of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who were still alive at that time, a number of them, they advised al Hussein, don't go. Don't go. From those people who advised him not to go, was Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, one of the close companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Also, Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, he advised al Hussein, don't go to Kufa. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he advised al Hussein, don't go. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri gave his reason. He gave his reason, like why you shouldn't go. He said to al Hussein, he said, I know that the people of Kufa cannot be trusted. They're not loyal people. They will promise you something and then they will very easily break their promise. They cannot be trusted. They're not loyal people. So don't go. Even though you have 18,000 people who have promised to be loyal to you, don't trust them. Don't trust them. They're not loyal people. But al Hussein, he was adamant in going. He said, no, I'm going to go. I want to fight against injustice. And he did believe that he had enough support to be successful. He did believe that those 18,000 people who promised they would stand by him, would actually stand by him. This is what he believed. And he left Medina and he went towards Kufa. All right. Now back to Kufa. What's going on in Kufa? Hani ibn Urwa has been killed by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Muslim ibn Aqil is still there. And they can't find him. But he knows that they're looking for him. And he knows that matters have escalated now. Now the matter has become much more complicated because Yazid has found out. So Muslim ibn Aqil... He talks to the 18,000 people who had promised their loyalty to Al Hussein. He says to those 18,000 people, look, Al Hussein is not here yet. It's going to take him a while to get here, but we don't have any time to lose. We need to act now. We need to make our move now, even before Al Hussein comes. Because if we wait too long, then this whole thing is going to be squashed. So a Muslim ibn Aqil, he tells those 18,000 people, we need to surround the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. We need to make a siege around his palace. That's the first step. That we need to get rid of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And he reminds these people, you have pledged allegiance. You have promised your loyalty to this cause. So now it's time to walk the talk. Now it's time to actually prove your loyalty. So let's go. Let's go to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and let's surround it. This is the first step of the revolution. All right, so now. 18,000 people. Out of those 18,000 people, how many people go with Muslim ibn Aqil to surround the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad? Out of 18,000, only 4,000 people go with him. 14,000 people say like, nah, we don't want to do it. This is what Abu Sa'id was talking about. These people, they're not loyal. right? So out of 18,000 people, only 4,000 people go with Muslim. But alhamdulillah, 4,000, it's still a pretty good amount of people. It's enough to go and surround a palace. So it's okay for now. So Muslim says, okay, I'll take these 4,000 and I will go to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and we will make a siege. We will surround his castle. So they go to the castle, the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and they surround it. Muslim ibn Aqil and these 4,000 people. Now Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he's inside the palace and he's caught off guard. Like, oh, what's going on here? They're surrounding my palace. So he knows how to deal with this situation. He knows these people. He knows the way that they think. So what did he do? He goes up the balcony of his palace and he starts throwing out bags of gold coins. Right? He said, yeah, gold, gold. So basically what is he saying here? Take the gold and leave. Take the gold and leave. So he starts throwing these bags of gold. And most of these 4,000 people who are there who promised their loyalty, they say, oh, gold. They start taking the gold and they leave. And they leave. So eventually, out of these 4,000 people, how many people were left with Muslim Ibn Aqil? Only 30 people. From 18,000 to 4,000, now we're down to 30 people. And by sunset, by Maghrib time, even those 30 people, they were gone. All of them were gone. Can you imagine the level of this betrayal? That out of 18,000 people, not one single one of them, 
Not one of them remained loyal. So by Maghrib time, it was Muslim ibn Aqil alone. He was alone. And of course, you know, you can't make a siege to a palace by yourself. Right? So Muslim ibn Aqil, he retreated to his tent. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, now he sees that the, the siege around his palace is gone, that he has gotten rid of everybody. He sends 70 men to go and capture Muslim ibn Aqil. Muslim ibn Aqil, he's just one guy, and you send 70 men to go and get him? He's trying to show his power, like you shouldn't have messed with me. So he sends 70 men to go and capture Muslim ibn Aqil. Now Muslim, he tried to resist, he tried to fight these 70 men off, but one against 70, no. He was not able to do it. So eventually they tied him up, and they took him to the palace of Ubaidullah, that you're going to have to face Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor of, of Iraq. So before he was taken into custody, he managed, to, he managed to get a letter secretly sent out to al Hussein. Before they took him, he was able to get a letter and give it to a messenger to go and take it to al Hussein. And this new letter, it said to al Hussein, Irji' faqad khadalaka nas Go back. Because surely the people, they have abandoned you, they have betrayed you. So the first letter, he said, come. And now this letter, go back, don't come. Right? Because the people, they have betrayed you. But Hussein was already on his way by this time. He was already on his way. Now, Muslim ibn Aqil was presented to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad executed him. He killed Muslim ibn Aqil and he beheaded him. He cut off his head. And then he took the head and he threw it outside the balcony of his palace to show the people, like, look, this is what I did to Muslim ibn Aqil. Then he took the body and he threw it in a different area, right? To show them that, you know, this is what happens when you try to revolt against us. This is what's going to happen. So he did that to show them the result of uprising. As we mentioned, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was, was a ruthless man, had no mercy, and he was very evil and heartless. All right. Now, Hussein is on his way from Medina to Kufa, and the second message reaches him while he's on the way. And he reads the message. Go back to Medina because the people of Kufa, they have betrayed you and they have abandoned you. So Al, Al Hussein is saying to his family members who are with him, he didn't have so many people with him. Because he thought that the army is there in Kufa. I just need to bring a few of my family members with me. He had less than 100 people with him, right? So he consults with the people who are with him that, look, you know, it seems that the people, they have backed off and they're not going to support us, so maybe we should go back to al Madina. This is what Muslim is advising me to do in this letter. And the people who are with al Hussein, they said, like, no, let's go, you know, Whatever happens, you know, we want to stand up against injustice. We will go and we will fight, inshallah. So they decide to move forward. They move forward. When they reach near Kufa, they reach an area that is close to Kufa. And Al Hussein, he asked, What is the name of this land? He asked the people, What is the name of this land? And it was mentioned to him, The name of this land is Karbala. Karbala. And then Al Hussein, he said, Karbun wabala. Karbun wabala. Karb, it means difficulty or hardship. And bala, it means a trial. So when they told him the name of this place is Karbala, he said, Karbun wabala. This is a place of difficulty and this is a place of trial. So with Al Hussein and his family members, the people who were with him, there were less than 100 people. Then the army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad came to meet them in Karbala. Now the army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was led by a general named Umar ibn Sa'd. And who was Umar ibn Sa'd? Umar ibn Sa'd is the son of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the first Muslims, one of the early Muslims, one of the closest companions to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is one of the ten who was guaranteed Jannah while he was still alive. The first person who shot an arrow in Islam. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. He is one of the 
one of the main major companions of the Prophet ﷺ, one of the most important companions of the Prophet ﷺ. But his son, Umar ibn Sa'd, was leading the army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad against al Hussein ibn Ali. So again, this just shows you that lineage, it really doesn't mean anything unless you are an obedient servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar ibn Sa'd's father was one of the greatest Muslims. But look at Umar ibn Sa'd being the general for this tyrant, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, against the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa al Hussein ibn Ali. All right, so al Hussein ibn Ali at Karbala, he had less than 100 people with him. Less than 100 people. Whereas the army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, led by Umar ibn Sa'd, they had 5,000 people with them. So al Hussein and, and his family members, they are outnumbered 50. To one, fifty to one. So Al Hussein realizes that you know this is this is not something that we can we can realistically win. So Al Hussein asks Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. He says, "Okay, let us let us go back to Medina, or allow me to go and meet Yazid in Damascus. Just allow me to go, and I will talk with Yazid in Damascus." So Hussein he gave Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad two options. He said, "Like." Either let us go back to Medina or let me go to Yazid. Let me meet Yazid in Damascus. And Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, this ruthless, evil tyrant, he doesn't agree to either of these. He says, no, we're not going to let you go back to Medina. It could have been resolved peacefully. They would have went back to Medina. But Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad says, no, you can't go back to Medina. We're going to fight you here. And he also rejects the second option as well. He said, like, no, you cannot go to Yazid. If you want to go to Yazid, I will take you to, to Yazid, but as a prisoner. We will tie you up and we will take you as a prisoner to Yazid. But you cannot just go to him like that. So al Hussein he said, no. I, I, if I meet Yazid, I will meet him with my honor and with my dignity. I, I refuse to be taken as a prisoner. So then Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he says, okay. If you don't accept it, then the only other thing that we're going to do now is we're going to fight. We're going to fight. So... The fighting began. Now before the fighting began, when Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad refused both of these, both of these options mentioned by Al-Hussein, he's not letting them go back to Medina, and he's not letting Al-Hussein go and meet Yazid. One of the members of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad's army, one of the members of the army that was against Hussein, was a man named Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Hanvali. He was surprised that why isn't Ubaidullah allowing Al-Hussein to go back to Medina? Or at least allowing him to go and meet Yazid, you know. The, even though this is a war and this is a battle, there are certain rules of war. If they say they don't want to fight and they want to go back, you need to let them go back. Or if their leader wants to meet our leader, then you should allow that. These are the unwritten rules of war. Even though the war is, war is fighting and killing and, and violence, yeah, but there are some rules of war as well. And this is one of those rules. And Ubaidullah is breaking these rules. So Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Hanzali, who is part of Ubaidullah's army, he said, no, this is not right. How can you do this? You have to accept one of his options. And Ubaidullah still refuses. So Al-Hur, he charges towards Al-Hussein's army. He charges towards their side. And Al-Hussein and his people think that Al-Hur is coming to fight with them. But instead, when he reaches them, he turns around. He has become part of Al Hussein's army. He said, No, I'm not going to be part of this. I will fight on the right side. If we're going to fight, I will be on the right side. So Al Hur ibn Yazid al Hanzali, rahimahullah, he made the right decision here. He joined the army of Al Hussein. And then the fight started. And Al Hur ibn Yazid was able to kill a few people from Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad's army, and then he was killed himself. Now Al Hussein and the few family members that he had with him. They fought valiantly. They fought with courage. And this is the day of Ashura that this happened. The 10th of Muharram in the year 51 of the Hijrah. They're fighting with bravery and with courage, but they're, they're just too vastly outnumbered. 50 to 1, right? So eventually they were all killed. All of the family members that Al-Hussein had with him. Every single last one of them, right? Except for there was a young baby, right? He, was, he survived. But the rest of them were all killed. And eventually it was al Hussein himself who was left fighting alone, right? And eventually he was also killed 
by a man named Sinan ibn Anas al nakhi He was stabbed with a sword by Sinan ibn Anas al nakhi and he was killed. Radiallahu anhu. This is how he became a shaheed. After he was killed by Sinan ibn Anas, a man named Khawli ibn Yazid al Asbahi came and severed his head from his body. Allahu musta'an. Look how they're treating the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. This boy who was so beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. They kill him and they're not satisfied with just that. They actually behead him after he is killed. They take his head off. They separate it from his body. So Khawli ibn Yazid al-Asbahi cut off his head and presented it to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad has the head of al Hussein in front of him and he's touching it. And he's showing disrespect to it. This was the, the evil nature of this man. So this is how al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu an was martyred in Karbala. He was 58 years old. He was killed at the age of 58. And it is mentioned that his body was buried there in Iraq. But his head was actually sent to Damascus. When Ubaidullah was presented with his head, he sent the head to Yazid. He sent the head to Damascus. So there are different narrations or different opinions regarding where his head is buried. So some say it is in Iraq, some say it is in Sham, in Damascus, and some say it is in Egypt. So there are a lot of different, you know, different opinions, and it is not known for certain, but perhaps the strongest opinion is that his head is buried somewhere in Sham, somewhere in Syria. So this was a great tragedy, and when we remember what happened to al Hussein, it makes us sad. But we don't express that sadness by beating ourselves and by ripping our clothes because this is not how the Prophet ﷺ ever expressed sadness. The Prophet ﷺ lost people who were beloved to him in his life. He lost Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. He lost other members of his family. He lost friends that were beloved to him. But he never reacted in the way, in the extreme way that we see some people react to commemorate the death of Al-Hussein. Al-Hussein radiallahu anhu, he has nothing to do with this. Now, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and Yazid are both responsible for the evil that they did. Yazid was a man of tyranny. He was a man of oppression. And we as Ahlu Sunnah have no love for Yazid ibn Muawiyah at all. As for Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, yes, we love him as a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we say that he made a mistake appointing Yazid as his successor, but we know for sure that he didn't realize what was going to happen, right? But as for Yazid, Yazid was not a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. When we mention his name, we do not say radiallahu an, we do not say rahimahullah, we do not make dua for him, and we have no love for this man. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal radiallahu an, he was asked by his son Abdullah ibn Ahmad, Abdullah ibn Ahmad said to Imam Ahmad, he said, Oh my father, there are some people who say that they love Yazid. There are some people who say that they love Yazid. And Imam Ahmad was surprised. How can anybody love Yazid? He said, Ya Bunayya, wa hal yuhibbu Yazid ahadun yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir? Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he said, Is there anyone who believes in Allah and the last day that can love Yazid? How can a person love Yazid when he is responsible? for what happened to the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's a common misconception that some people have. They, they will say that, okay, Sunnis, they respect Yazid. No, not at all. They will say Sunnis love Yazid. Not at all. The people of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we know that what Yazid did was evil. He was a tyrant, he was an oppressor, and we have no love for him at, at all. And also Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he's the one who gave the order for al Hussein to be killed. When it didn't have to end that way, he could have accepted the request of al Hussein and let him go back to Medina or let him go and meet Yazid, but he refused to do that. And he ordered for al Hussein to be killed. He will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that on his neck and on his back as well. So what happened, of course, on that day, on the day of Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, the year 51 of the Hijrah, it was a tragic historical event. But as we said, we cannot confuse history with religion. So what happened in Karbala does not change anything in Islam. It does not bring into Islam any new practices. It cannot, right? Because it happened after the passing away of the Prophet and after the end of Revelation. So any of these actions that people do to commemorate the death of Al-Hussein every year on Ashura, 
there is no basis for doing it. There is no basis in doing it in Islam, right? So we fast on the day of Ashura. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel on that day from the Fir'aun. This is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said. And he fasted as a thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa followed that example and we followed that example. That is the religious significance of Ashura. As for what happened 40 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa yes, now we went over the history of that and I hope you all have a better understanding of what happened. And I hope that we all come out of this with a better appreciation for Al Hussein radiallahu an and his family and his relationship with his grandfather, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If we understand these things and we have knowledge about these events, we will be able to, to answer people's questions in the right way. And a lot of questions come out, come out about this, especially during the month of Muharram. So inshallah, now we will be better equipped to, to answer those questions and to spread the knowledge that we have. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us upon the sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to instill in our hearts the love of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us upon the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to raise us up with him on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. May, may we be with him, may we be in his company on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and in Jannah. Ameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the correct understanding of these events that led to this tragedy at Karbala. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide those people, to guide those people who react and commemorate this tragedy in a way that has no basis in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of them. Ameen. Barakallahu feekum. Wallahu alam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam. Wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Barakallahu feekum. Yes. All right, so the sister is asking, when we see the people who are beating themselves with these chains, why are they doing that? Like we mentioned, what they are doing has no basis in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ never reacted to the death of a loved one in such a way. And there is no uh, evidence for doing this in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ or the actions of the companions. Now why are these people doing it? They're doing it. They're saying that they're doing it in order to show their sadness. That we are so sad about the martyrdom of Al-Hussein. We are so sad about what happened to Al-Hussein. So to show our sadness, we will beat ourselves. And they also feel that what they are doing is an expiation for the betrayal of Al-Hussein. That Al Hussein, he was be betrayed by the people of Kufa. So they say we have to punish ourselves for that betrayal. We have to punish ourselves for that betrayal. So we will beat ourselves with chains to punish ourselves. So of course, there is no basis for doing that in Islam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wala taziru waziratun wizra ukhra." That no one will carry the burden of what another person has done. Those people who did that, you know, for almost 1,400 years ago, right? You are not responsible for what they did. So why do you have to beat yourself for what other people, for the crimes or for the mistakes that other people made? So of course there's no basis in Islam for doing that, but this is the reason why they do it. Yes. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yes. Of course, you know, if, if people disagree upon something, then they need to get together and they need to discuss it with, with an open mind and an open heart, with both sides looking for the truth. Sometimes a person will disagree with the person and his goal is just to win the argument. Like, I'm going to argue with you, but I'm never, going to, I'm never going to concede my points. Even if he sees that the other side is actually right, a person's ego may prevent him from accepting the truth. So... When you get into a discussion about a disagreement, it should always be with the intention that you know, we're looking for the truth. If the truth is with you, I will accept it. If the truth is with me, you should accept it. This is how you know, disagreements should be. No, it should not lead to bloodshed. It should not lead to bloodshed, of course. Yeah. I mean, they, we should try to resolve our matters you know, in, a, in, a, in a cordial manner in the best way possible. But you know, the last resort in, in, in extreme political situations is, is war. And sometimes, you know, in history, some of the, some of the uh, expeditions and some of the battles that took place were justified because there was no other solution than that. But, of course, that's the last resort. And, you know, first of all, we should try to uh, make people understand the truth and get them to accept the truth.
Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar